Hey everybody, Stu Smith here going live, taking some questions, going to show some CSS videos as well. So we have uh, maybe an hour's worth of questions that we can do, uh, send them. Happy to chat about mainly fitness related, but if you have military, law enforcement, firefighter training slash fitness related questions, those are obviously what I do. Um, so before we get started, I usually get people, as people start tuning in, I started off with an article that I wrote. And this one has been one of those articles that I needed to write a long time ago because I constantly get the question, how many miles should I be running before I go to Bud's? And the reason why I think there's so many answers out there is because it depends on the individual. And to be honest with you, it really doesn't matter. And let me explain why that is. <clears throat> because I have seen people make it through running 20, 25 miles a week. I've seen people make it through running more than 50 miles a week. You know, what I, I don't have the answer for just one number. Um, I probably was somewhere between 35 and 40 miles a week when I when I went through. Um, so there. So if you dig into the recent Stu Smith Fitness dot com article, go to Stu Smith Fitness dot com click the articles link you'll see it i just posted it on my instagram as well as part of my story and it goes into some detail that a lot of people i think don't realize first of all this is my opinion but my opinion based on many variables that produce a better answer and what i mean by that is you know someone's athletic history can very well determine how many miles a week that person should be running prior to getting to buds. If you're already a running athlete, my suggestion is run 50% of what you normally do, especially if you're 60, 70 miles a week, like cross country runners. And you need to spend most of your time in the pool and in the weight room. And also, you know, getting good at calisthenics, but typically runners get really good at calisthenics quickly. They're already built for muscle stamina. They're built for endurance. That's really what calisthenics are at the high rep levels. Your first few reps are strength exercises. Your 20th or 100th rep is an endurance exercise. So endurance athletes typically do real well with that. What they lack is load bearing and just overall strength and power. Um, so that's where they need to probably focus on. If they suck at swimming, they need to spend more time in the pool. So cut your running in half at least and spend more time lifting and swimming. That's the running athlete. The strength athlete needs to do a little different. You know, if that strength athlete is a huge dude, he probably needs to lose some mass and run, you know, every other day for a while, you know, to build up, you know, those running legs, um, you know, especially if you're susceptible to injuries because you're a heavier athlete when you're running. If you're new to running entirely, you know, that's going to be a longer progression of mixing in probably more non-impact cardio at first mixed with running every other day again until you can handle daily mileage. Or a lot of people screw up as they just start running 20 miles a week out of nowhere and wonder why they're injured. You actually have to build up to 20 miles a week. I have a 20 mile a week running program that I don't recommend beginners do, you know, uh, because it's it's hard to do and it's hard to do it because you're going to get injured. So um, if you're a ground zero runner, you know, someone who's a beginner. You know, you probably need to start off your running at about five miles a week and then progress logically into that as long as you don't get injured. You know, if you're a little lighter runner, you can probably get away with, you know, 10 miles a week when you first start. But then 
a 10 to 20 or 10 to 15 percent progression each week will take you to 20 miles in probably four to six weeks. Um, and then, you know, if you can get up to 25, then try to make those miles faster. Because I think where a lot of people screw up is they just add volume just to add volume. And um, it, it just it just winds up them getting good at running slowly versus actually being able to meet the standard of six minute miles for a mile and a half and seven minute miles or faster for a four mile timed run. Now, those are well above the standards. Um, you can actually run an eight minute mile and just barely pass with the minimum. In first phase, you got 32 minutes to run four miles in boots and pants. And let me tell you why you don't want to be reliant on your eight minute mile pace is because there's going to be a day five, four mile timed run. And you've just got through doing hundreds of leg exercises the day before uh, with log PT or, you know, running up dunes and just doing squats and lunges. Um, and your legs are going to be toast. And if you can't maintain that sub eight minute mile pace, you're going to fail your run in first phase. And next thing you know, you fail a couple of those and you're done. So don't get good at running a lot of miles slowly. Try to get really good at running six and seven minute mile pace without it being a gut check. That is where you need to go. And athletes go wrong by just running too many miles slowly. Now, they probably have gotten that information from a running coach who coaches runners to build an aerobic base for their running sport. However, if you're not a runner, you don't need to do 70 miles a week to build a base. You know, you can cut that down to 10 miles a week and do more biking and swimming and rowing and other non-impact cardio and still build a good cardio base to handle the type of endurance training that you're about to endure, um, you know, or make that transition from a strength athlete or a swimming athlete who needs to get used to the impact of running. Um, you know, all of those different issues determine how many miles a week you should be running before you leave. And you may need to start with almost nothing and run every other day with a lot of non-impact cardio. You may be able to start with 20 miles a week and build up to 40 pretty easily. Um, but if you want a good median number, my advice is it's somewhere between 25 and 35 is the median number. And I don't really have a determining factor on the high end or the low end. It really comes down to preference. It comes down to, um, you know, you feeling like you need to run a little more. That's what I felt. Like I, I never once felt like I needed to lift weights and I didn't uh, prior to buzz. I just did calisthenics and, and running, but there are in swimming and there, but there are athletes out there that need to get stronger before they go through this process. So otherwise they're going to get crushed in those first four weeks, you know, when they're doing nothing but logs and boats and fireman carries and things like that. But there's so many different um, variables real quick. The variables are athletic history, um, Age and injury history, that's going to determine how many miles you should be running for sure. Younger athletes tend to get injured more because their bones are soft. Uh, your current abilities, that's going to determine where you should start. You know, are you a ground zero runner or you have already built up to 20 over the years? Height and weight, heavier runners probably need to run a little bit less than a lighter runner just for pure impact pain. Um, and when I say a little less, that would be the high end or the low end of that range I mentioned between 25 and 35. Um, running cardio-based training. 
you know, yes, you need to run to get better at running, but don't necessarily need a bunch of long, slow distance to build your cardio base. You can do that with non-impact cardio, as I've mentioned many, many times before. Running performance, you know, timed runs. Are you able to hit a six, seven minute mile pace? If not, start practicing that pace. You know, goal pace running is a very important. Rucking and load bearing ability. Can you ruck yet? If you haven't started rucking yet, probably need to add in some rucks on leg days. That's a great way to top off your leg day is end it with a ruck and a swim with fins. Um, don't need to do it too often, uh, but just be able to do it without getting crushed under the load. Uh, running options. There's so many running options. There's sprints. There's goal pace. There's hills. There's sand. There's long, slow distance. Diversify your running training so you can mix in all of that. That's just going to make you a better runner overall. And then, of course, do as many non-impact cardio options as you need to, you know, to still work your legs and your lungs without the impact of um, impact of running and getting those normal injuries that come with long distance running. Um, I did also throw in an ideal answer too, like the ideal runner. Um, and I'll let you guys read through that. That's, that's a pretty good one. Um, but yeah, check that out. At Buds, they do they retrieve objects at the bottom of the pool? Yes, they do. Yeah, their mask with their teeth when you're doing drown proofing. How many people able to build, how are people able to build seven days a week of running like Cameron Haynes or David Goggins? Um, I don't know. I don't do it. I've never run seven days a week, ever. Um, five to six days a week at the most. I don't think it's necessary for one. Um, you know, if you want to run a marathon or ultra marathon, sure, probably need to do that. But, you know, Bud's is only five days a week. So my recommendation, if you're trying to do something like, you know, spec ops training, understand the training days and your days off and build your body for that. Um, you're asking the wrong person on that one because I don't run seven days a week. I don't even work out seven days a week. I take a day off. Uh, what do you think running six, seven minute mile per mile pace in hilly terrain on flat ground? I can run a 1342 mile, but yesterday I did a hill route and it was 1550. Yeah, you're going to be slower in hills. I, my recommendation is get used to running on hills and sand, trails, um, uneven terrain. All of that you're going to have to endure uh, with a backpack, without a backpack. Uh, once again, diversify your running. I'm all for hills. We usually do hills on leg day. Um, in fact, we do two different leg days a week. One is a hill day, and the other one is a soft sand beach run day or ruck. And then we follow it with leg calisthenics and or weights. And then we swim with fins. So those are our spring and summer leg days. Makes running harder, works the legs harder. Definitely recommend that for sure. What are your thoughts on incorporating cardio weight training simultaneously? I do it all the time. For example, do a high intensity circuit, weight training, or separate the two. Um, I, you know, diversify, you know, some weight trainings are better off with not mixing cardio in there, especially if you're trying to work on your one rep max strength. Um, however, if you're trying to mix in some speed work uh, and some power, you know, faster rep stuff, you know, I like to mix in a little cardio to it as well. Um, maybe not a, a fast cardio, but something to kind of give me a little recovery time for the next set. So if, if you can get your conditioning to a point where you can rest with cardio, that's really good. And I highly recommend it. Um, no matter what you're doing, whether you're lifting or doing calisthenics, a lot of times we will do, 
you know, high rep calisthenics workouts and rest with a quarter mile or a half mile and do it again and do these sets again. And um, one thing it does, it helps you get used to that calisthenics to running transition, which you will see again and again whenever you take a fitness test. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just a logical way to train for those type of events. Plus, you'll see it in your selection training as well. I mean, you will do countless push-ups and pull-ups and mix in runs in between sets. And, you know, that's, that's just the way it works. Good question. Let's see. Hey, uh, I think I got all the questions here. If you do have uh, another question, um, you can send it. I don't know why it's not scrolling. Cause that's it. All right. So let me, um, let me pull up a, a CSS video real quick and we will watch a CSS and discuss what's going on. So, all right, let me back this up and share my screen. All right, you guys should be able to see this. Good. All right, so here we go. Kick off the wall, transitions into the stroke. Now he's doing this on the side, and then you can see, I think I critiqued this one the other day on TikTok. Um, the one thing he's doing wrong here, he's kind of over-rotating a little bit, and he tends to look up towards the ceiling when he does this. So he didn't do it too bad there. But notice this bottom arm pull here. Notice how big it is. It's sweeping. Like it doesn't need to be that big. And it kind of throws off your timing a little bit whenever you're doing that. Um, it's not wrong. It's a way to do it. I just prefer swimming with a little shorter like breaststroke skull on the bottom instead of taking it all the way down to my waist and bringing it out like that. Um, I'm going to show you him cleaning it up here and he actually speeds himself up, but I will say this, I mean, it's not bad because he's doing this in less than 50 seconds. So that was like a 48 second 50. Um, let's see if he, I can't remember if I cleaned it up the second time with him or not. No, nope, that's a different swimmer. Different swimmer, different swimmer. I didn't download it. I'll be darn. Sorry about that. I didn't download him cleaning it up uh, or didn't uh, take a video of him cleaning it up, but he was able to clean it up and actually less effort hits 46 seconds on that 50. Um, you know, which, which is what you want to do. You want to have less effort in swimming the same pace as previously that, that just means your technique is getting better um so definitely recommend um learning how to you know focus on technique fewer strokes to get across the pool cleaner strokes to get across the pool and next thing you know you're swimming the same time or faster with less effort that's when things, you know, things are working. You say my camera's not working. It seems to be working on my end. I'm not, not sure what's going on. I'm roughly a year out from going to basic. How many days a week should I train? Um, good question. You know, it depends. It depends on your last two years, what you've been doing. If you're starting from nothing. You know, your workouts are going to be kind of easy as you first start up. You know, if you've been doing something and playing sports and can handle six days a week, I would recommend six days a week. I'd also throw in a mobility day in there. Huh. I'm not sure what's going on. Says my camera's working. Let me see if I can do my settings again on my camera. Sorry, guys. All right, so yeah, microphone's working, camera's working, it's all plugged in. Let me make sure it's all 
plugged in there. Sorry about that, folks. I don't know. Like, I can see myself, but I guess you guys can't. So. Huh. I don't know what to tell you, folks. I um, guess that kind of shuts down our, uh, the video. Let me uh, sh go back to sharing my screen. Maybe that will work better. So we're going to go. All right. So let me know if you guys can see this. So this is a swimming with fins first time. And the one thing he's doing wrong here is the overhand recovery on this. Maybe I screwed up. Oh, I see what I did. I see what I did on this. I think I have two. I just need to go back into the uh, into the broadcast with my face there. So anyway, so what the this looks really good. The way you want to do swimming with fins is you want to uh, constant flutter kick, but this top arm has to recover underwater. You see how it looks like it's a freestyle recovery. That's the problem with his stroke. And his shoulder mobility is lacking. Um, so if he were to do this in the open water, he would swim in a big circle. I want to show you. Like he's trying to fix it. because But notice how he goes from one end of the lane to the other. Almost hits the wall here. Mainly because his shoulders are lacking um you know, the, the ability to go straight over his head. So what is happening is he's looking like a banana in the water. He's kind of curved in the water like that. So I'm going to see if I can get back into that. Let me know if you guys see that. You guys should be able to see me. Unless I'm all screwed up with technology, which would not be the first time. Somebody comment there that you can see me or can't see me. And I'll just continue either answering questions on audio and just sharing my screen to show uh, swim videos. Anybody? Anybody? Can't see me. Damn. Damn. Well, that sucks. Come back in here. So I just added myself back to the stream. He said, it's telling me it's working, but I don't get it. So I'm going to just go back to uh, sharing, um, sharing my screen on... Um, on CSS shares. So here we go. So when you guys uh, watch this screen, can you see me in the left-hand side of the screen when you do this? If you can't, no big deal. All right, so I'm going to show you this uh, this swimmer here. He's pretty good. Just a good kick off the wall, double arm pull, transitions. And he's a big, tall swimmer, so still can't see me. Can you guys see the swimmer? So this is a really tall swimmer, great runner, cross-country guy type. And uh, he is putting together a really good swim. I think he does this in like 45, 46 seconds. But it looks pretty effortless. So the unique thing about this guy is he's pretty tall. And everybody says because he's tall, he can swim well. I'm going to show you a short guy that's probably about six inches shorter than this guy. He's about 6'2", and this other guy's at less than 5'8". I'd say he's probably um, in the – I'll show you this one, too. This one's really good. So, wait a second. All right, so this guy right here is a little wrestler. He's probably about 5'6", 150 pounds. And let me tell you, any wrestler that can swim – is going to be an excellent candidate to do um, 
to go to any spec ops program because they're just so good. Uh, they're tough, got muscle stamina, got endurance. And if you can find one that can swim, you got yourself a really good candidate. Wrestlers that can swim have a really high uh, graduation rate. Also, lacrosse players that can swim are really good as well. This guy's solid. Um, do recon do CSS? Yes, there's guys going to recon training out of the Naval Academy that are doing CSS. Um, let me show you this one. This one's always fun. How about this? Instead of a wrestler swimming, here's the difference between a wrestler and a competitive swimmer. I think I showed this yesterday, if you guys missed it. But this is a competitive swimmer doing his CSS. So he's actually been working out with us for like six years. Back in 10th grade, he swam like a six-minute 500. And uh, he has now finished college and competed in college at, you know, a D1 level. And now he's doing a CSS. And that's about as smooth as it gets right there. And if you do the math on this, that was 35 seconds. 35 seconds to do a 50-yard uh, swim. Um you know, that is sub six pace right there. That's probably 550 if you do the math. 36 would be six minutes. So, yeah. Six minute swims, ridiculous. And it looks effortless, looks slow because he's not wasting any energy. So, his goal is um, to be able to do this swim in like seven minutes easy. And then he's able to have a little more energy to focus on his other weaknesses that, you know, he's actually a good pt -er, but his weakness is running, which is very typical for swimmers. Uh, Mike BB is having a wrestling background the same as MMA. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very similar. I mean, fighting, wrestling, grappling, punching. You know, one that makes you tough as hell and your conditioning for that is really good. Um, and then uh, if you can swim on top of it, you're pretty solid. And you probably run to maintain weight and things like that. So you're probably going to be a decent runner or two. Um, so you have a lot of strengths coming into this journey of transitioning into uh, the CSS. So I'm not sure why my camera is not showing, but I'm just going to keep, um, you know, swimming going on there while I take your uh, take your questions. Should have a couple more videos in here that we can share, and I'll I'll answer these as we go. Um, let's see. I'm a rising senior high school. Going in my senior year of football, what do you think the most effective way to transition from football to a SEAL candidate? Dude, that was me. And when I was 18, I was a football player, power lifter, and anything over 100 meters was long distance. Um, first of all, don't be in a hurry to join the military at 18 year olds just because you graduate. Because you probably need a couple of years of transitioning out of football into becoming a better spec ops candidate, meaning you have higher running abilities, you can swim, and you have high repetition calisthenics. You're not going to do that in four to six months. <coughs> so um, don't be in a rush. 18-year-olds at BUDS make up, uh, man, 80 90% of the attrition rate. So I, I would not be in a rush to join at 18 years old. Do a couple of years of community college, finish college even. Go at 22 is my recommendation. The guys that are 18-year-olds that make it are unicorns. Um, 
My recommendation is to do more calisthenics, get out of the weight room, and uh, do triathlon training where two-thirds of your cardio is non-impact cardio. And that's what I did. And it took a little while. So Mike BB says, I can't tr swim trying to teach myself. Send me a video. We'll critique it for you. Let's see. Let's see if this works. Not sure if you can see me, but um, I am here still talking. I'm going to share some more screens here just so you can see something at least with me talking. Got a whole bunch of videos here. Um, let's see if this works. All right. Oh, this is one of my favorites. You know why? Because it's me. <laughs> so here it is. So kick off the wall. Try to stay streamlined. See the sh shoulder mobility there. That really helps with uh, your streamline. The swimmer had the same thing. He's obviously much better than I am, but this is a scissor kick turning into the CSS. The swimmer used a breaststroke kick. <clears throat> so as you can see here, it goes top arm, bottom arm, kick and glide. We'll go into that transition here in a second. A little double arm pull. Transition out, top arm, bottom arm, kick, hold the glide. Let's try to hold that glide for one Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull, boom, right on it. So I think I did this in like 46, maybe 47, looks like, yeah, 46 seconds. So if you do the math on that, that is a sub eight swim, probably in the 740 range. Um, if I were to hold that out for nine more laps and you can see it's not a lot of effort so that's the beauty of it it's a hard pull it's a hard kick it's a fast glide but it's not a whole lot of rpms I mean strokes per length when you find yourself doing double digit strokes to get across the pool <clears throat> you're wasting a lot of energy and i would highly recommend getting some technique training to fix your swim for sure. All right, so I'm going to transition out of this and stop sharing. Um, do they swim in Rangers and Green Berets? Very little. You're going to mostly ruck and run in that. Let me know if you guys can see me. All right, Luis says, uh, can you tell us the difference between AFSW selection and SEAL SQT? Um, and what makes the selection processes so different? Well, SQT is not a selection. You've already been selected at BUDS. So if you think about what really is BUDS, BUDS first four weeks, the three weeks prior to Hell Week and Hell Week, that is basically selection, right? That is taking 150 people that start and whittles it down to probably 25 or 30 each class. So now you have the class that's going to learn about SEAL stuff. You go into the next phase, you learn diving. Go into the next phase, you learn land warfare, shooting, land nav, all of that stuff. <clears throat> and then when you graduate, you go to SQT and you learn to another level. That's kind of like the Q course, right? So you're going to learn things to another level. Um, you're going to learn to jump. Um, more diving, more land nav, more shooting, more, you know, new CQB type stuff. Um, you're going to get cold weather survival training, hot weather survival training, all, all of it. Um, so that is the difference between SQT. ASFW selection is really similar to the kind of the first four weeks of BUDS, if you will. So it's a shorter period of time. Uh, BUDS is 26 weeks long. But if you were to look at it compared to Army SF, Air Force, SW, and BUDS all together, the first four weeks of BUDS are basically selection. After that, 
it's training and very few people ever not make it after after that <clears throat> good question though um I, you know what i wrote an article about um air force special warfare um and navy special warfare PST pass tests. Um, let's see here. Where is that article? It's on stewsmithfitness.com. So if you look at the article, it's called The Difference Between the Air Force Past and the Navy Special Warfare PST. Now, I will say I need to update this article because the Air Force just changed the physical abilities standards test. I think that's what it's called, pass test. And they change it to the term IFT, which is initial fitness test. And then they have an OFT once you're in the pipeline. And that is called the officer fitness test, or the, I'm sorry, the operator fitness test. So they have changed the name of it, but it's the same test. They just, instead of the past test, they called it the IFT now. Uh, third phase is the hardest physically. Um, no, first phase is. That's where everybody quits. 80% of your class will not finish four weeks of buds. And then you may lose a few others due to failing tactical tests or doing something stupid. Very rarely do someone fail runs or swims after first phase, but it happens because the standards do get harder. Um, let me see. Do I have any other share screens here? Uh Let's see here. Let's throw this one in here just to, uh, like I said, I can't tell you. I'm assuming you guys still can't see my face on uh, on this video. So I'm just going to uh, just put a swim video in there so you guys can see something. Uh, not bad on the CSS here. You know, once again, it looks relaxed. Double arm pull, transitions. I don't think this one was particularly uh, um, fast, but it wasn't slow either. I think this was a 50 second 50, which is a great 820 swim. And, um, you know, it's perfect. If you can get a 50 second 50 for 10 laps in a row, you got yourself an 820. Most people die for that. Definitely. So, um, yeah, sorry for the technical difficulties. I'm assuming you guys can't see my face again. Um, I'm going to shut it down uh, just because I have a uh, another workout I need to go to. And I am um, signing off. You guys check out that latest article on how many miles. Um, You know, how many miles a week you should do. I will answer one more question. I see Caleb popped one up. I said, I know you said not to rush into it at 18, but I've already started training and going away from lifting. I think I can do it. Why Why do 18-year-olds fail? Well, it's a perfect storm for failure. All right, this is a great one. You need to read this article called The Perfect Storm for Failure. And then I want you to prove me wrong if you're going to still not take my advice. Um, you know, I have no problem. I get proven wrong every class, but I also get proven right by every class because countless people fail that are in their teens when they go through uh, selection. So here, here's why. You're 18 years old. You leave home for the first time, right? You're living in a new town, new place. You're sharing a room with 
50 people trying to learn new faces and new names. Um, you're getting yelled at all the time. Um, uh, just constantly, you know, your girlfriend breaks up with you in the process and you miss your home, you miss your bed, miss your mom. That's things happen at 18 years old. That's what happens at 18 years old. It is the perfect storm for failure. Then you add in buds training to it and you are now being asked to perform at the highest level you have ever even considered your body to be able to do and you start doubting yourself because you lack some emotional maturity um, and you don't make it. That is what happens to the 18 year old mind and body. Uh, most of them aren't finished growing yet and they just get injured and then they they can't go forward with it. You know, when your bones are still growing, they're soft and they get hurt. That's all I'm going to say. So I tell you that not because I hate 18 year olds. I tell you that because statistically speaking, you have about a 4% chance of making it through buds at 18 years old. 19 years old, it's a little better. 20 years old, it's a lot better. 21 and above, probably 21 to 24, that's where your average class age is going to be. And you might have two or three high school kids, or not high school kids, but 18-year-olds in the mix. So my buds class, and it really hasn't changed much, over 100 teenagers, we graduated three. So you do the math on that and tell me why you're better than 97% of people who are going to buds. There you go. That's the truth. You know, statistics don't lie. So you do your thing. I wish you all the luck in the world, but just know that it's a tough challenge, regardless of your age. In a lead position at work, want to cease the stress hinders recovery? Want to state the stress hinders recovery and training? Don't want to quit. Curious as to your... Th I have no idea what you're asking. Want to transition into a different role? The team as the stress hinders recovery. Dude, email me because... This little half sentence, I don't know what you're talking about. Stuart Stu Smith. And I'll be able to answer you maybe if I can understand your language. All right, folks. Um, sorry, I got to go. Just do. Um, check, out, um, check out TikTok if you're looking for CSS help. You know, I got over 100 videos over there. I do have over 100 CSS videos on this YouTube channel as well, um, but uh, they're kind of hard to find. You got to look through them pretty deeply uh, to do it. I think there's over 600 other types of videos on this YouTube channel from, you know, podcasts and live Q&As and exercise uh, videos, as well as swimming videos, too. So you guys can check those out. Uh, but TikTok's nothing but CSS and swimming. So it's it's a very useful tool because of the voiceover feature that they allow on that one. Also, um, if you guys are go to Stu Smith Fitness, read some articles. Uh, if you decide to buy something, use the Compete20 code and save 20%. Uh, if you got any questions, send them my way. If I didn't get to answer yours... Um, Send them to me, Stu at StuSmith.com. Happy to assist. Send your videos to the same place. I'll chat with you later. Have a good one.